uh, evaluating it for someone. I'd like to know where the car came from. Um, and that leads to one of the best places to buy a, a, a late model used car. And that's down at your local car rental lot. Uh, they sell off the cream of the crop retail. They sell them with the records, the service records on the car. And they give you a pretty good warranty with it. Some of them give you as good a warranty on a two-year-old used car as you get on a new one. Are most people aware of this brand? No. And I think they're missing a good debt. I think they're still thinking that the rental car is not the car you want to buy because it's been hammered to death. Not so. Those automobiles have been maintained under what we talked about earlier as the severe service recommendation. Those cars spend more time in the shop than the average automobile does just being maintained because the car rental company can't make any money if that car is laid up on a breakdown. So they've got to take care of it. Mm -hmm. Which takes us into the area of uh, lemon laws or cars that are lemons. And some states are implementing uh, laws to protect consumers from cars that just shouldn't have been produced, shouldn't have been on the road. Uh, it seems fair to me. What do you, how do you feel about it? Well, I think the lemon law was something that was needed. However, there's a portion of what's happening to cars that I'm not sure was addressed in the law. And that goes back to what we did for Fram and Autolite this spring, which was our training clinics all over the country. I think the, th th this is my opinion, that the Lemon Law should have been tied somehow, some way, with the training level of mechanics. Because I'm not just sure, I'm not positively convinced that lemons are built in Detroit or uh, Tokyo or Wolfsburg or uh, Rome or wherever the car came from. Uh, yeah, they make them out of the factory with some errors problems. However, there isn't a problem on a piece of machinery that shouldn't be able to be corrected by a, by a good technician. And I just, I, I'm just saddened that that wasn't part of the law. We talked about buying, or the tips you gave us for buying a used car. Uh, is it different when you're looking for a new car? A little bit when you're looking for a new car. Again, you're going to look for an automobile that lights your fancy, that, that, that turns your key, so to speak. But with a new automobile, I recommend that people go out and rent one just like it for a week. Okay? And drive it around for a week. In other words, if, they're gonna, if they think a new Mustang is going to be their cup of tea, go rent a Mustang from one of the car rental companies for a week or from the dealer for a week. Drive it for a week and find out if you can live with the car. I know of many cases where automobiles have been called lemons, and the only reason they've been called lemons is because after the person bought the car, they realized they'd made a mistake in the type of automobile they bought, had no recourse to get rid of the car, so now the car was a lemon. That test drive you take when you go to a dealership just isn't enough. Well, you just don't get enough. You're, not, you're usually not going to test drive the car you're going to buy. You're going to test drive a loaded car similar to it that the dealer uses as a demonstrator. And it may have no relationship whatsoever to the car you're going to buy other than the shape of the body. You know, Brad, you were talking about uh, the, the owner's responsibility in maintaining his or her own car. And no, some, in some cases, no matter how much maintenance goes into that car, there are going to be problems with it that are out of the, the owner's control, such as the roads that that car has to drive on. Is, is that the car's worst enemy? <laughs> you know... Here in New England, we deed potholes. We sell them by the foot, I think. I'm not sure. <laughs> anyway, you see Volkswagens used, used for filling potholes. No, I'm only kidding on that. But, yeah, roads are, are not usually the, the car's friend. Um, you take potholes. Spring driving, late winter driving, spring driving. The front end of the automobile takes a tremendous beating. The shock absorbers, the springs take a tremendous beating. And then if the car is in service after that... Uh, after the potholes are filled in service, such as front end alignment, wheel balance, uh, shock absorbers replaced as necessary, yeah, you get uh, tremendous wear on the tires, tremendous wear on the suspension, and the car doesn't handle right. There. So you're spending a lot of money for those kinds of repairs that come from bad roads. Absolutely. What am I likely really to run into, Brad? I mean, just odds here, going into my little neighborhood garage is... Am I likely to be ripped off? Am I likely to get a good job done on my car? What are the odds in my favor, or with the house, so to speak? Um, that's a problem that has many, many faces. You know, the federal government says that 50 percent of the automobile repair dollar is wasted. And I'm going to have to, at this point, kind of agree with that. Brad, we're going to take another break and come back and talk to you more about cars and, and keeping them on the road here in America.
This is HealthScope, a look at our changing health care system. Hospitals going out of business? It seems hard to believe, but experts agree it's quite possible. Many hospitals are faced with cash shortages, severe enough to force them to close their doors. But some hospitals are finding there is an alternative. It's called multi-hospital systems. By merging into large organizations, hospitals can share their expertise, services, and sometimes costly overhead. Multi-hospital systems, both for-profit and not-for-profit, will offer a lifeline for many hospitals not only keeping them open to serve patients in their communities, but helping them control the high costs of medical care. HealthScope is brought to you by the American College of Hospital Administrators, representing the nation's health care executives for over 50 years. We're back again with Brad Sears, who is the host of Public Television's Last Chance Garage. I'm Jan Coleman. Brad, we were talking before about repairs. Uh, the guarantees or the warranties on repairs are, uh, I suppose those are just uh, uh, pro forma. Get those and get it in writing when, when you're getting your car work done. Okay, when you take an automobile into a service shop, what you should do is make sure that the guy who's greeting you, the guy who's taking your order, is writing things down on a repair order. And the repair order should include your name, address, the mileage on the vehicle, the date, the registration number, and in some states, I'd even recommend the ID number, the vehicle ID number, be written on the repair order. Then your symptoms ought to be written on the repair order. And I very much discourage people from signing a repair order at that time that has a definite fix on it until a car's been diagnosed. Um, align front end, balance front wheels, tune engine, overhaul engine, do this, do that, without the car having been into the shop and been diagnosed first. Um, I don't like, I really don't like, I don't trust what I, what I usually call garage door diagnosis. In other words, that's the diagnosis that's made on the apron just outside the garage door by the consumer and the shop owner or the service manager standing there talking about the car. Should you always get the parts back that they oh, say they replace? Absolutely. Two reasons for that. Number one, uh, you've got a pretty good idea that those parts have been replaced on your car. Secondly, you can go... I mean, they don't have them just laying around, extra spare parts they could have picked up from a junkyard. Well, see, well they wouldn't go out and pick them up from a junkyard, but mm -hmm. if everybody got their parts back, then they wouldn't have extra parts laying around from other people's jobs. Uh -huh. Makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you can go have them analyzed somewhere. Uh, you can then find out if that part had been replaced on your car. And you should always get your parts back. In the case of parts that have to be returned for rebuilding, such as alternators, starters, generators, and things of that nature, you want to see the part before it's returned to the rebuilder, the old part. Okay. However, I discourage taking home mufflers and tailpipes. You know, they're, they're a bit dirty. You can see that the new muffler or tailpipes on your car. Well, you certainly heard it. Uh, you got you it. You can hear the difference yeah, there. What, what's that commercial? I don't want to name the company. But... <laughs> I know which one you're talking about. <laughs> sure. I think we all do. Yeah, I like the one about I'm your new neighbor. I don't want to hear from you again. <laughs> <laughs> and a new muffler would certainly take care of that problem. Give us an idea of what I can do. I, who know nothing about cars to keep my car going. The first thing you can do is to take your owner's manual and sit down with it and read it as a good novel. Uh, Shakespeare it ain't, but it is good reading. Not only that, it'll save you a whole bunch of money. There's things in the owner's manual of the car that'll tell you how to start it, how to drive it, how to warm it up when it's cold, all kinds of different things. Then there's a maintenance section in the owner's manual that lists the maintenance procedure necessary for that car over the first 50 or 100,000 miles of its life. And of course, if it ends at 50, you just go back and start all over from the beginning for the second 50,000 miles. And it'll list when your car needs an oil change, oil filter, lubrication, um, air filter, spark plugs, tune-ups, tire rotations, wheel balancing, alignment, and so on. And determine whether you're a severe service driver or a normal service driver. I think we'll find that about 80% of the people in this country are severe service drivers. At least that's what we found out running our little friend clinics around because we ask each group that we have in front of us the questions and then they determine whether they're severe service or not. In fact, uh, the last group that I was in front of was in Columbus, Ohio. 
and I think out of a hundred and some odd people sitting there, there was only one that considered himself normal service after we got through. So we at Fram look at um, oil filter changes and oil changes at about 3,000 miles under that situation. Spark plugs, you ought to start thinking about spark plugs at about 10,000 miles. Uh, maybe check them, pull them out, or replace them at 15,000 miles or a year, whichever comes first. Um, you know, with no, no other questions than that. Um, and tire rotation, tire pressure, tire balance, those are the main things to be considered. Okay, and I think if we take that to heart, we just keep our cars younger, longer. Do you think Detroit could do more in that when you talk about thievery of cars and chop shops, do you think Detroit could do more in, in, in being able to help you secure your car so that somebody doesn't steal it? You can build cars without wheels or, you know, things like that. <laughs> now, really, if somebody wants your automobile and wants it bad enough, it's gone. Period. You can discourage the joyrider. You can discourage the thief who only wants to steal it for transportation from one place to another place. But the guy who is really intent on sending the car out of the country or in making the car disappear permanently in little pieces, um, one way or another it's gone. I mean, you know, all over the country we've seen guys with ramp trucks and tow trucks and all different devices to steal cars. Um, Rolls Royce, for instance, wants the key removed from the ignition because of the ignition system they have in their car. The car can't be shifted, and the only way it can be stolen is to be towed, and they're stolen. Do you have ride sharing in Massachusetts? Well, we live down in Cape Cod, and down in Cape Cod, we just don't have the traffic problems that they have in some other parts of the city. Lucky However, you. When I, when I do drive into Boston, I do see a whole bunch of vans rolling along the expressway towards Boston, and they're called commuter van pool. So we have ride sharing through the van, pool, van pools, and um, I'm not sure whether it's eased the traffic situation or not, but uh, a lot of people are sleeping in those vans every morning going up the expressway. Brad, I'd like to thank you for talking to us about cars and, and keeping them on the road, keeping them young, uh, and uh, on all of the other areas we got into today. Brad Sears is host of Public Television's The Last Chance Garage. He uh, he used to run his own automobile service shop, and he teaches people all about cars and how to keep them running better. He writes a syndicated column, hosts a radio show, all of this, uh, once again, talking about cars. And he has been our guest today. I'm Jan Coleman. This has been Milwaukee's Issues. Milwaukee's Issues is a weekly pre-recorded public affairs presentation of 94 WKTI. Join us again next Monday morning at 142 for another edition of Milwaukee's Issues, only heard here on 94 WKTI. The energy-free home is our topic for this conversation from Wingspread. We come to you.